Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. If you are new here, then my name is Miss Estrick and I've been teaching for over 14 years and I'm here to help you to get to grips with those hardest concepts in biology, improve your study skills and improve your exam technique. So today's video is specifically made for exams 2022. And back in February, the topic lists were released. And you may have already seen that I've released the paper one, two and three for A-level, but I've had so many requests for paper one and paper two for AS level. So here is the first one for AS level, paper one. If you wanna skip ahead to any of the particular topics, then just click along the bottom to the time codes. Now, if you do need that extra boost to help you to remember all of this content, I do have my active recall workbook, which will really help with that. This active recall workbook is specifically designed to improve your memory of the key concepts by testing what you do and don't know. It includes a range of different style to question you and all of the answers. So click the link in the description if you want that extra boost. But for now, let's get into AS paper one. So within the eukaryotic cells, the key organelles that you need to know the structure and function of are all the ones listed here. And we're gonna go through each of them one at a time. The nucleus, the key structures within that are the nuclear envelope, nuclear pores, nuclear plasm, chromosomes, and the nucleolus. And the overall function of the nucleus is where DNA replication occurs, and it's a site of transcription, which is where mRNA is made and it contains the DNA, which is a genetic code for the cell. We also have within the nucleolus, that is the site of RNA production, and it's where ribosomes are made. The endoplasmic reticulum, you have the smooth and the rough, and we can see here the top diagram, we've got the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and we can tell because we've got the ribosomes on the outside, and the other side of this top diagram is this smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and that has no ribosomes on the outside. Now, the RER, which is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, that is where protein synthesis occurs because of those ribosomes on the outside. The SER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, that is where you have the synthesis of lipids and carbohydrates, and they also get stored there as well. The Golgi apparatus is a folded membrane making this cysteine shape, and we have vesicles that will pinch off from those cysteine once whatever it is that's going to be modified has been modified and packaged. And we've got the whole list here of the different things that would happen. So it could be that the carbohydrates are being added to proteins to make glycoproteins, which might be embedded within the cell membrane. You can also produce secretory enzymes, carbohydrates, transport and modify lipids. We get lysosomes. Molecules are also labelled with their destination, essentially meaning they're going to have a molecule added so they'll be able to bind to receptors on the target cell for where that molecule is needed. Lysosomes are bags of digestive enzymes. And this is often involved in phagocytosis. So the enzymes that are required to hydrolyze the bacteria or virus, whatever it might be, would be in a lysosome. There'll be exocytosis, which is where the products are going to be released to the outside after it's been destroyed. The mitochondria is the site of aerobic respiration. So you'll have lots of ATP production here. It's a double membrane organelle with the outer membrane and the inner membrane is this folded part making up the Christi. And the inner membrane is where oxidative phosphorylation happens, which is one of the key stages in aerobic respiration. They have their own loop of DNA, which is very similar to prokaryotic DNA. And this is so that they can code for the enzymes that they need in respiration. Ribosomes, now these are found in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, and that is because they are not membrane bound. Ribosomes are just made up of rRNA and proteins. You do have different sizes though. So the ATS is the larger size ribosome in eukaryotic cells. 70S is the smaller sized ribosome found in prokaryotic cells, as well as in mitochondria and chloroplasts so that they can make their own enzymes. And it's the site of protein synthesis. 
The vacuole, which is only found in the plant cells, not in animal cells, this structure is filled with fluid and surrounded by a single membrane called a tonoplast. And this is what helps to make the cell turgid and provide support. You'll have temporary stores of sugars and amino acids within the fluid as well. And the pigments within it may colour the petals and that's what helps to attract pollinators. Chloroplasts, again, only found in plants. And this is the site of photosynthesis. You have, again, it's a double membrane organelle. And we have the outer membrane, the inner membrane. And then on the inside, we have even more membranes. And that is these thylakoid membranes, which stack up to create what we call a grana, if it's plural, or just a granum, if we're just looking at one of those stacks. And the thylakoid membranes are embedded with proteins and pigments such as chlorophyll, and therefore it's the site of the light-dependent reactions in photosynthesis. The stroma, which is the fluid part surrounding the thylakoid membranes, you have lots of enzymes in this location which are needed for the light independent stages of photosynthesis. Cell walls are not in animal cells, but they are in fungi and plant cells, and they help to provide structural strength to the cells and prevent them bursting if lots of water moves in by osmosis. And that's because they contain a particular molecule that provides strength, and in plants that's cellulose, and in fungi that would be chitin. The plasma membrane is found in all cells, and this is in the cell membrane, so the cell surface membrane, but also when we say it's a double bound or membrane bound organelle, it's also made up of this phospholipid bilayer with the different molecules embedded within it. And the function of the plasma membrane is it controls what can enter and exit the cell. Prokaryotic cells, for example, bacteria, you need to be aware of the key differences. So it could come up as a comparison or a contrast question. So first of all, the cells are much, much smaller. They don't have any membrane bound organelles. They do have ribosomes though, because ribosomes are not membrane bound, but they have the 70S size ribosomes. They don't have a nucleus because that is a membrane bound organelle. So instead their DNA will just be as a single loop, which is free within the cytoplasm. They do have a cell wall and that is made up of murine. Sometimes they might also contain plasmids, which are additional loops of DNA. They might have a capsule around the cell, which is to help prevent desiccation and to evade the immune system. And sometimes they'll have flagella, it might be one, it might be many, which is to help them to be able to move. But those aren't always found, those are only sometimes found in prokaryotic organisms. Viruses are acellular and non-living. The structure of virus particles consists of genetic material, capsid and attachment proteins, which we can see over here. So we have the genetic material in the middle. We have the capsid, and then we have the attachment proteins, or here they're labeled envelope proteins. Viruses replicate inside of host cells, and that is why it's very difficult to destroy them because you would have to destroy the host cell to be able to destroy the virus. Now you need to know methods of studying cells. And the reason this is so important is the way we've discovered these internal structures or organelles is because of these advances in the methods to study cells. So advances in microscopes and then also cell fractionation and ultra centrifugation to be able to isolate particular organelles to examine. So we'll go through each of these methods of how to study cells. First of all, with the microscopes, there's a couple of key definitions you need to be aware of. You also need to know the three main types of microscope. There are optical microscopes, which are the light ones, which you'd be using in school. You then have electron microscopes, but you can have either a transmission electron microscope or a scanning electron microscope. The definition of magnification is how many times larger the image is compared to the object. Resolution of a microscope is the minimum distance between two objects in which they can still be viewed as separate. And the resolution of an optical microscope is determined by the wavelength of light. And the resolution of the electron microscopes is determined by the wavelength of the beam of electrons.
And because that wavelength is much shorter, that is why they have a higher or a more powerful, that is why they have a much, much higher resolution, meaning that the distance between the two objects is smaller. So let's compare the two general types of microscopes in more detail. The optical microscope, we've already said it's the light, but it is a beam of light, it's a beam of light that is condensed to create the image. In contrast, an electron microscope, it's a beam of electrons, which is condensed to create the image. And what is used to condense the light and the electrons is also different. The beam of light is condensed using a lens, whereas the beam of electrons is condensed using electromagnets. The optical microscope has a poorer resolution due to the fact that light has a longer wavelength. So that means that the electron microscopes, because electrons have a shorter wavelength, they have a much higher resolving power. There's also a lower magnification for the optical, higher for the electron microscopes. You can have colour images though, and you can view living samples with the optical microscopes. So those are two big advantages. The electron microscopes can only produce black and white images. And because electrons can be easily absorbed, you have to have your sample in a vacuum. And because it's in a vacuum, you can't actually observe any living samples using an electron microscope. Now, just to go back to this black and white image point, you can still get coloured images if colours are added on programmes like Photoshop afterwards. Because the optical microscopes have a lower resolution, small organelles in a cell are not visible. So you can't see details of the mitochondria, chloroplasts, ribosome. You can just see some of the large organelles like we can see here. You can see the nucleus, you can see the DNA, you can see the chromosomes. The electron microscopes, they have much higher resolving powers as we said, and the difference between the transmission and the electron is that the, tra the transmission, you have extremely thin specimens and the electron gun produces a beam of electrons that transmits or passes through the specimen. So some parts of the specimen will absorb the electrons and therefore appear dark. Some parts won't and the electrons would have passed through and they appear lighter. And we get these 2D images where we have the darker and lighter, depending on whether the electrons were absorbed or not. And because there's a higher resolution, that is why we can actually see the details internally of some of those small organelles. A scanning electron microscope creates 3D images in contrast. The specimen does not need to be thin, and that's because the electrons are not going to be passing through the specimen. Instead, the electrons are beamed onto the surface and the electrons are scattered in different ways depending on the contours. And that is how we get these 3D images, which we can see here in these different blood cells in a sample from the blood. You could be asked to calculate magnification of an image. So the formula that you need to remember is I am. And that is the image size equals actual size times magnification or you can rearrange it to work out the actual size or the magnification. And the key thing that you need to be aware of when you are doing these calculations is the image size and the actual size have to be in the same units. So you need to be familiar with how you convert from millimeters to micrometers or micrometers back into millimeters. Those are the two most common conversions in a magnification question. But if you want to know any of the other conversions, here they are. You might also need to be able to measure the size of a specimen using the eyepiece graticule. And inside of the optical microscope, there is a scale on a glass disc, which is called the eyepiece graticule. So it'd be just here within that eyepiece. And this can be used to measure the size of objects you're reviewing under the microscope. However, each time you change the objective lens and therefore the magnification, you have to recalibrate the eyepiece to work out what the distance between each of these different divisions is actually worth.
Now you need to know how to do that, but I'm not going to go through that in the summary video, but I'll link the video up here of how to calibrate the eyepiece graticule. Cell fractionation is the final way that you can study cells, and this is used to isolate the different organelles so that they can be studied further. First thing that happens is the cells are broken open to release the contents and the organelles. The cells need to be prepared in a cold, isotonic and buffered solution. And you need to know why it has to be those three conditions. So it has to be cold to reduce enzyme activity. And that's because when you break open the cell, you'll be releasing enzymes which wouldn't typically be in contact with the organelles and they might damage them. It has to be isotonic so that you don't have excess water moving in or out of the organelles by osmosis because we don't want the organelles to burst or shrivel because then we won't be able to study them. And it has to be buffered because if it became too acidic or alkaline, again, it could damage the organelles. Now, cell fractionation is a two-step process, homogenization and ultra-centrifugation. So first of all, homogenization is when you break open the cells, and that can be done in a blender. As long as you have, as we said, the solution that you're blending up your sample in, as long as the solution that you're blending your sample in is cold, isotonic and buffered. Then we'd need to filter to remove the large debris and then the filtrate, we can then use ultra centrifugation to isolate the different organelles. So we'd put our sample into a centrifuge and we'd spin at different speeds. The organelles are going to separate according to their densities and that is why we have to spin our sample at different speeds. And this is what differential centrifugation is. So when we spin our sample, the centrifugal forces cause pellets to form at the bottom with the most dense organelles. So we can see here in this first image, we've got all of the organelles equally distributed. And if we first spin at low speed, the most dense organelle will form a pellet at the bottom. We would then remove that pellet and spin the rest of the filtrate again at a slightly faster speed. We'd then get the next most dense organelle forming the pellet and we repeat this process at increasingly faster speeds. So each time that liquid, which is the supernatant, is removed and the pellet is what the organelles will be in, and we can examine those. Now, just to let you know the order of the density, in that first centrifugation, the nuclei are the most dense. So those would be isolated in the first spin. The next most dense are the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, then the lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, and finally the ribosomes. So that would be the order in which you would collect your different organelles. We then move on to cell division, and eukaryotic cells enter the cell cycle and divide by mitosis or meiosis. But in topic one, you only learn about mitosis. In comparison, prokaryotic cells replicate by binary fission and viruses do not undergo cell division at all because they are non-living. They do still replicate though, but viruses replicate inside of a host cell. They will invade that host cell by injecting in their nucleic acid, so their genetic material, and then it will be the host cell that uses that genetic material to replicate the virus particle cell cycle that eukaryotic cells will be going through includes these key stages. Interphase is the longest stage of the cell cycle and it includes G1, S, G2. G1 is when the cell is going to be increasing in size and the organelles will double. S phase is when DNA replication happens. G2 you'll have further growth but also it says preparation for mitosis in G2, you'll have this error check stage. So if there are any errors in the DNA replication, the cell would be destroyed at that stage. Nuclear division is either mitosis or meiosis, but in topic two, we just focus on mitosis. The final stage of the cell cycle is cytokinesis, 
and this is when the cytoplasm divides to create the two new cells if it's mitosis. Mitosis is split into four key stages, which are our PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The key facts about mitosis are it's only one round of division, genetically identical cells are created, the cells are diploid, which means there are two copies of every chromosome, and this stage is used for growth and repair. So a specific example of that, which we'll see later in this video, is the clonal expansion of B cells. So that is growth in the sense of we're creating lots of new cells. So in prophase, the chromosomes will condense and at this point they become visible. And in the animal cells, the pairs of centrioles will move to opposite poles, which means opposite sides of the cells. The centrioles are going to be creating these spindle fibers, which are released from both poles to create the spindle apparatus. And these will attach to the centromere and the chromatids on the chromosomes in the later stages. Plants have a spindle apparatus, but they don't have the centrioles. In metaphase, we can see that the chromosomes will then line up in single file along the equator. And the spindle fibers are released from those centrioles at the poles, and they'll attach to the centromere and also the chromatids. In anaphase, the spindle fibers will start to retract and pull back towards the centrioles. And in doing that, they'll pull on the centromere and chromatids. And this causes the centromere to divide in two. And the individual chromatids are pulled to the opposite poles of the cell. And therefore, it separates the chromatids. And once those chromatids are separated, we now actually call them chromosomes. Now this stage requires energy in the form of ATP and that's provided by respiration from the mitochondria. In telophase, the chromosomes are now at each pole of the cell and become longer and thinner. The spindle fibres will then disintegrate and the nucleus starts to reform. The final stage in the cell cycle is when the cytoplasm splits in two to create the two new genetically identical cells which the mitotic index can be calculated by counting first of all how many cells are visible in the field of view and then counting the number of cells that are also visible but in a stage of mitosis. You can then do a percentage calculation. So you'd be doing the number of cells that you can see in a stage of mitosis divided by the total number of cells present and times it by 100. Prokaryotic cells don't go through mitosis, instead they go through binary fission. The first step of that would be the replication of the circular DNA and of the plasmids. And then the second stage would be division of the cytoplasm to produce two daughter cells, each with a single copy of the circular DNA and a variable number of plasmids. Viruses are non-living, so they don't undergo cell division. Instead, they inject their nucleic acid into the host and the host cell replicates the virus particles. So now onto plasma membranes. All cells and organelle membranes have the same structure. It's this fluid mosaic model, which, which is named because of the fact that it does have some slight movement, and also it's composed of a range of different molecules, such as phospholipids, proteins, glycoproteins, and glycolipids. All of these molecules are arranged within the phospholipid bilayer, and they create the partially permeable membrane. To create the bilayer, the phospholipids align in this manner because of the fact that the phospholipid has a hydrophilic head due to that negative charge on the phosphate group, and that causes it to be attracted to water. Whereas the hydrophobic tails, those are repelled by water but can interact with lipids. So the phospholipids end up spinning round so that the tails are opposite each other, the heads are on the outside where they can interact with water. Cholesterol is present in some membranes too, and this will restrict the lateral movement of other molecules in the membrane. This is useful as it makes the membrane less fluid at high temperatures and prevents water and dissolved ions from leaking out of the cell. The other components of the membrane are mainly the proteins, and these are embedded across the cell surface membrane, either as peripheral, meaning they're just on the outside, sometimes called extrinsic, or they could be integral, sometimes called intrinsic, meaning it spans from one side of the bilayer to the other. 
The peripheral proteins provide mechanical support or they can be connected to proteins or lipids to make glycoproteins and glycolipids. The peripheral proteins provide mechanical support or they can connect to carbohydrates to make glycoproteins and also carbohydrates can bind to the lipids directly to make glycolipids. The function of these is cell recognition or as receptors. The integral proteins are protein carriers or protein channels involved in the transport of molecules across the membrane. Protein channels are tubes and these fill with water which will enable water soluble ions to diffuse across the membrane. Whereas the carrier proteins will enable molecules to bind with them and therefore larger molecules like glucose and amino acids can cause those carrier proteins to change shape and therefore transport the molecule to the other side of the membrane. So when we say that the membrane is partially permeable, what we mean by that is only lipid soluble substances and very small molecules can pass across the membrane by simple diffusion. Other molecules such as water soluble or polar substances and large molecules can't simply diffuse across the membrane. Therefore, they have to be transported across by other means, which could be facilitated diffusion, active transport, or if it's water, osmosis. So simple diffusion, first of all, this is the net movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And this will continue until an equilibrium is reached. And this process does not require any ATP. The molecules do still have energy to be able to move, but this is just due to the kinetic energy that they possess, and that is why they're able to move constantly as a fluid. For molecules to diffuse across the membrane, they have to be lipid soluble and small. If they're not lipid soluble or small, then it will be facilitated diffusion instead. And this is still a passive process because the molecules are moving from an area of higher concentration to lower, but because they can't simply diffuse through the phospholipids, instead they have to diffuse through proteins. Now this could be through protein channels, where we have those tubes filled with water, and therefore water-soluble ions can dissolve and then diffuse through. This is still selective though, as the channel proteins only open in the presence of certain ions when they bind to the protein. Carrier proteins will bind with a molecule such as glucose, which causes a change in the shape of the protein. This change enables the molecule to be released to the other side of the membrane. Osmosis is the movement of water, and that will be from an area of higher water potentials to an area of a lower water potential across a partially permeable membrane. The water potential is the pressure created by water molecules, and it's measured in kilopascals and represented by this symbol here. Pure water or distilled water has a water potential of zero. So you cannot get one any higher than zero. It's always going to be zero or negative. And that means when solutes are dissolved in water, the water potential will be negative. And the more negative the water potential, the more solutes there must be dissolved in it. Now, three key terms that you need to know linked to osmosis are isotonic, hypertonic and hypertonic. An isotonic solution is when the water potential is the same in the solution and the cell. Hypotonic is when the water potential of the solution is more positive, so closer to zero or closer to pure water compared to the cell. Hypertonic is when the water potential of the solution is more negative than the cell, so there'd be more solutes dissolved in it. And in an animal cell, we can see the impact that would have. In an isotonic solution, because the water potential is the same, there's not going to be any net gain or loss of water. In a hypertonic solution, there'll be more water moving out of the cells by osmosis and that can cause animal cells to shrivel or crenate. If animal cells, such as red blood cells, are put into a hypotonic solution, 
That would mean water would be moving into the cell by osmosis, and if enough water moves in, it can cause the cell to burst. Active transport is the movement of substances from a lower concentration to a higher concentration, and this requires metabolic energy and a carrier protein. So the process by which this happens is, first of all, it's always through carrier proteins only. It is not channel proteins for active transport. The molecule will bind to the carrier protein, and it can only bind to proteins which have a complementary receptor shape, so it is still selective. The ATP binds to the carrier protein as well from the inside of the cell, and it is hydrolyzed into ADP and PI. This causes the carrier protein to change shape and therefore it releases the molecule to the other side of the membrane. The phosphate ion is then released and the protein can return to its original shape and the process can then happen again as long as there is plenty of ATP present. Co-transport is a type of active transport and you learn about it across the course but one of the key examples you learn about is the co-transport of glucose or it could be amino acid with sodium ions in the ileum. And to absorb glucose from the lumen of the gut, there has to be a higher concentration of glucose in the lumen compared to the epithelial cell. But there's usually more glucose in the epithelial cells. And that is why active transport and co-transport are required. So the first thing that has to happen is the sodium ions, which are shown in blue here, are actively transported out of the epithelial cell into the capillaries. And that will result in a lower concentration of sodium ions within the epithelial cells. And that creates this concentration gradient from the ileum to the epithelial cell. And therefore the sodium ions can diffuse down their concentration gradients into the epithelial cells. The proteins the sodium ions diffuse through though is a co-transporter protein. So either glucose or amino acids will also attach and are transported into the epithelial cell with the sodium ions, except the glucose is going in against its concentration gradient. The glucose, once in the epithelial cell, can then move by facilitated diffusion from the epithelial cell into the blood. Now you also need to be aware that cells may be adapted for rapid transport across their internal or external membranes. So it could be that cells have an increased surface area, so things like microvilli for example, or there could be an increase in the number of protein channels and carrier molecules within the membrane as another way to increase the rate of transport. The last section of topic two is all about immunity and we begin by looking at identifying self and non-self cells. So your body's immune system has cells to be able to identify the presence of pathogens and potential harmful foreign substances compared to your own body cells and that's so it can destroy the foreign items and not your own cells and those cells are called lymphocytes. But how can lymphocytes then actually distinguish between a pathogen and your own body cells? Well, each type of cell has specific molecules on its surface that identify it. And these molecules are usually proteins, so they'll have this unique 3D tertiary structure. And this is how they can identify whether it is an antigen from a pathogen or whether it is one of your self antigens. If a non-self cell is detected, a response will be triggered to destroy that cell. And these different surface molecules enable them to identify pathogens, which we've mentioned, so bacteria, fungi, viruses, but it could also be cells from other organisms of the same species. And that can be harmful for individuals who have had organ transplants. It could also be abnormal body cells, for example, cancer cells. And finally, toxins, because some pathogens release toxins into the blood, such as the bacteria cholera. Now, an antigen is a molecule that generates an immune response. 
and this is because it triggers the lymphocytes. They are usually proteins and they are located on the surface of the cells. Now, antigen variability is this concept that pathogen's DNA can mutate frequently. If a mutation occurs in the gene which codes for the antigen, then that means the shape of the antigen on the outside of the virus, the fungus, the bacteria will change. And if that happens, any previous immunity that you may have had to the pathogen is going to be lost. So it will no longer be effective as all of the memory cells in the blood that you have will have a memory of the old antigen shape and not the new one. And this is known as antigen variability. The influenza virus mutates and changes its antigens very quickly. And this is why a new flu vaccine is created every year to account for that change. So looking at your immune response then, if a pathogen gets past the chemical and physical barriers, so for example, your skin is a physical barrier and stomach acid is a chemical barrier, then your white blood cells are the next line of defense. Your white blood cells have a specific and also non-specific response. The phagocytes are a non-specific response, meaning that they will destroy any foreign item that they come across. Lymphocytes have a specific response though, and this is where the idea of detecting using antigens will come into it. So let's look at phagocytosis first of all. A phagocyte is a macrophage cell, which is a type of white blood cell and they are found in the blood, but also tissues. Phagocytosis, as we said, is a non-specific response. So any non-self cell that is detected will trigger the same response every time to cause the destruction of that object. So the stages of phagocytosis are, first of all, the phagocytes are in the blood and the tissues, and any chemicals or debris released by the pathogens or abnormal cells attract the phagocytes and that will cause those white blood cells to move towards the cell. There are many receptor binding points on the surface of the phagocyte which we can see here. They will attach to the chemicals or the antigen on the pathogen via the receptors. The phagocyte then changes shape to move around the pathogen and engulf it and once engulfed the pathogen is contained within a vesicle, which we call a phagosome. A lysosome within the phagocyte will then fuse with the phagosome and it will release its contents. And the contents is a lytic enzyme called lysozyme. And lytic enzymes are able to hydrolyze. So the result is that, that enzyme will hydrolyze and it breaks down the pathogen. Any soluble products are absorbed and used by the phagocyte and anything else is released as waste and debris. So that is our non-specific response. But now if we look at the specific responses, which are by the lymphocytes, first lymphocyte we're going to look at are the T lymphocytes or the T cells. So all lymphocytes are made in the bone marrow, but the T cells mature in the thymus, which is why they're called T cells. And this is classed as the cell-mediated response. So the first thing to be aware of is the cell-mediated response is specific to T cells responding to antigens on the surface of cells. So it involves antigen-presenting cells, or APC. An antigen-presenting cell is any cell that presents a non-self antigen on their surface. Infected body cells will present the viral antigens on their surface if they are infected. A macrophage which has engulfed and destroyed a pathogen will also present the antigens on their surface. Cells of a transplanted organ will have different shaped antigens on their surface compared to your own self cells. And cancer cells will have abnormal shaped self antigens as well. So all of these are presenting antigens on the cells. So they are antigen presenting cells and can therefore trigger an immune response. So the cell mediated response then, once a pathogen has been engulfed and destroyed by a phagocyte, the antigens are positioned on the cell surface. 
and that is why we'd now call that phagocyte an antigen presenting cell. Helper T cells, which are a type of T lymphocytes, have receptors on their surface that can attach and bind to the antigen on antigen presenting cells. And once those two cells are bound, it activates the helper T cell to start to divide by mitosis. And that then means we get a very large number of cloned cells. So essentially, this stage is to make sure you end up with lots of helper T cells which have the correct shape to bind on to that particular antigen. So you'll have lots of helper T cells within your blood that have different shaped receptors to be able to bind onto different shaped antigens. But if you have one collide, that will then activate that particular T cell with that particular shape receptor to divide by mitosis to make large cloned copies. Those cloned helper T cells then differentiate into particular types of T cells. Some remain as helper T cells, which then go on to activate the B lymphocytes. Some can stimulate macrophages to perform more phagocytosis. Some become memory cells for that particular shaped antigen. And some become cytotoxic killer cells or cytotoxic T cells. And what those cytotoxic T cells do is destroy the abnormal or infected cells that have the antigen on their surface. And they do this by releasing a protein called perforin, which embeds in the cell surface membrane to make a hole or a pore, so that any substance can now enter or leave the cell. Now this causes death because you can have lots of water move in and therefore the cell will burst or you could have lots of water moving out and therefore the cell will actually shrivel up and die. This is most common in viral infections because viruses infect body cells of the host. Body cells therefore have to be sacrificed to prevent further viral replication. And this is actually why you get a really sore throat when you have a cold, because those cytotoxic T cells are destroying the infected body cells in your throat to try and prevent that virus dividing and spreading further in your body. Next then, we move on to the B lymphocytes or the B cells. As we already said, all lymphocytes are made in the bone marrow, but B cells mature in the bone marrow as well, which is why they're called B cells. This is now called the humoral response, and this is the one that involves antibodies. Antibodies are soluble and transport in bodily fluids, and humor is an old term for body fluids, and that's why this is called the humoral response. There are approximately 10 million different B cells which have antibodies on their surface, complementary to 10 million different antigens. And antigens in the blood will collide with their complementary antibody on a B cell, and the B cell takes in the antigen by endocytosis and then presents it on its cell surface membrane. When that B cell collides with a helper T cell, that can then activate the B cell to go through clonal expansion and differentiation or clonal selection. So this is the step where there's that link between the cell mediated response with the helper T cells binding via the receptor to the antigens on the B cells to activate them. Once activated, the B cells undergo mitosis to make large numbers of the cells which have that particular antigen on their outside. And these can then differentiate into plasma cells or memory B cells. The plasma cells will go on to make antibodies complementary in shape to that particular antigen. And the memory cells can divide rapidly into plasma cells if you are reinfected with the same pathogen and therefore antigen later on. And that means that you can make large numbers of the correct shaped antibody so rapidly that you should be able to destroy the pathogen before it causes any damage and symptoms. So the memory B cells can live for decades in your body, whereas the plasma cells are only short lived. Memory B cells, though, cannot make antibodies, but they can divide by mitosis 
and then differentiate into plasma cells. So this is what results in the large numbers of antibodies being produced so rapidly that the pathogen is destroyed before any symptoms occur. And that's what it means when we say you are immune to a particular disease. It's because you have these memory B cells so you can destroy the pathogen before it causes any symptoms. And that would be an example of active immunity. Primary and secondary response is referring to the number and the speed at which antibodies are produced when you are first exposed to an antigen compared to your second exposure. So the first time you're exposed to a new pathogen and therefore a new antigen, it takes a little bit longer for the antibodies to be produced because you have to go through that initial step of those 10 million different B cells colliding until you have the correct shape antigen antibody binding. So that can take a couple of days and that's why you have a slower response in producing the antibodies and also you don't actually make as many. But because memory B cells are made, if you are exposed for a second time, you will be able to create those antibodies very, very rapidly and in much larger numbers. And this is what is meant by the primary response and the secondary response. So if we look a bit more at antibodies, antibodies are an example of quaternary structured proteins because they're made up of four polypeptide chains. The part shown in purple is described as the variable region. And that is where you would have the part of your antibody that binds onto particular shaped antigens. The part in red is constant, so it would be the same for different antibodies. We can then see we have one longer chain, which is heavier, so we call it the heavy chain. And we have a shorter chain, which is called the light chain. And this bit here where it is variable, as we said, that is the antigen binding site. Now those antibodies are actually flexible and that enables an antibody to bind to multiple antigens. So we can see we've got binding to two antigens here and then this antibody is binding to two as well. And as a result, they all end up clumping together. And we call this agglutination. The advantage of agglutination is if you've got a big clump of antibodies and antigens which are going to be attached to the pathogen, it makes it much easier for the phagocytes to locate and therefore destroy the pathogens more rapidly. So we've talked about active immunity. Passive immunity, though, is when the antibodies are introduced to the body. So you haven't made the antibodies yourself. You are just gaining the antibodies. So that means that the pathogen didn't cause the creation and differentiation of plasma cells or any memory cells, so you won't have any long-term immunity. Examples of passive immunity could be antibodies passed to a fetus through the placenta or through breast milk from the mother to their baby. Active immunity, as we said, is when the immunity is created by your own immune system following the exposure to the pathogen. But this can be either natural or artificial. And natural is following an infection where you've actually had that pathogen within your body. Artificial is following the introduction of a weakened version of the pathogen or antigens via a vaccine. So if we go through then how vaccines work, small amounts of weakened or dead pathogen, or it could just be the antigens, are introduced either to the mouth or injected into the body. An exposure to those antigens activates the B cells to go through clonal expansion and differentiation. So that was the clonal selection part where we have mitosis occurring to make large numbers of those B cells. Those then differentiate into plasma cells and memory B cells. As we said earlier, the plasma cells will make antibodies, but the key bit of importance for a vaccine is the fact that B memory cells will also be produced and those can stay in the blood for years. So that means that if you are infected with the actual pathogen, those memory B cells, if they collide with the antigen, will divide rapidly into plasma cells when you are reinfected and therefore you create large numbers of antibodies so rapidly 
that you shouldn't get the symptoms of the disease. Or if you do, they'll be very, very mild and you should be able to overcome the disease more quickly. Now, not everyone is able to take vaccines for various reasons, but the concept of herd immunity is if enough of the population are vaccinated, the pathogen cannot spread easily amongst the population anymore. So this provides protection for those who aren't vaccinated. For example, if you already have another illness, which means it'd be too dangerous for you to have the vaccine. Um, if you have a lowered immunity, if you're too young, and sometimes if you're pregnant, you're not able to take vaccines as well. Now, the structure of HIV is made up of four key components. We have the core, and that is the genetic material, which is RNA, and the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And this is needed for the viral replication when it's in the host. You also have a capsid, which is an outer protein, which you can see just here. You then have the envelope, which is an extra outer layer made out of the membrane taken from the host cell membrane. And then we have protein attachments on the exterior of the envelope to enable the virus to attach to the host's helper T cells. So the way that HIV replicates in helper T cells is that first of all, it's transported in the blood until it attaches onto a CD4 protein, which is one of the attachment proteins on the outside of helper T cells, which we can see just here. The HIV protein capsule then fuses with the helper T cell membrane, enabling that RNA and enzyme to be injected or enter into the host's cell. The HIV enzyme reverse transcriptase copies the viral RNA that's been injected into a DNA copy and moves to the helper T cell nucleus and this is why it's called a retrovirus. Here, the mRNA is transcribed and the helper T cell starts to create viral proteins to make the new particles. Someone's described as HIV positive when they are infected with HIV. AIDS is when the replicating viruses in the helper T cells interfere with the normal functioning of the immune system. So someone who is HIV positive doesn't necessarily have AIDS. With the helper T cells being destroyed by the virus, the host is unable to produce an adequate immune response to other pathogens and is left vulnerable to infections and cancer. It is the destruction of the immune system that leads to death rather than the HIV directly. So the very final thing is this concept of monoclonal antibodies. Mono meaning one, and clonal meaning identical. Antibodies are proteins, which we looked at, and they have these binding sites complementary in shape to a particular antigen. And this has been manipulated to create monoclonal antibodies. And that can be for me medical treatments, medical diagnosis, it's used in pregnancy tests, it's also used in tests such as drug testing and testing for other viral diseases. So targeted medication, we're gonna go through that example first. This is an example of direct monoclonal antibody therapy. So what we mean by that is some cancer can be treated using monoclonal antibodies, which are designed with a binding site complementary in shape to the antigens on the outside of the cancer cells. The antibodies are given to the cancer patient and they will then attach onto the cancer cells only. While the antibodies are bound to the cancer cells, this prevents chemicals binding to the cancer cell, which will enable uncontrolled cell division. Therefore, the binding of these monoclonal antibodies prevent the cancer cells from growing. And as they're designed to only attach to the cancer cells, they're not going to harm any other normal cells. Indirect monoclonal antibody therapy can also be used to treat some cancers. The monoclonal antibody is created exactly the same, except there will be a drug attached to them. Indirect monoclonal antibody therapy starts with the same process of creating a monoclonal antibody which has a binding site complementary in shape to the antigens on the outside of cancer cells. 
but this time a drug is also attached to the antibody. The cancer drugs are therefore delivered directly to the cancer cells and can destroy those cells only. And this reduces the harmful side effects that traditional chemotherapy and radiotherapy can produce. And this is sometimes called a bullet drug because it's been directed to just one particular site. Medical diagnosis is another use. And as we said, this could be in pregnancy tests, viral tests, so influenza, could be in bacterial tests as well, cancer tests. Most recently, we've seen in COVID-19 lateral flow tests as well. And these use the ELISA or the ELISA test. So the ELISA test, which stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay, or ELISA, ELISA, uses two antibodies. So first of all, the first mobile antibody, which is complementary to the antigen being tested for and has a coloured dye attached to it, we can see just here. Part C, we have a second antibody, which is complementary in shape to the antigen as well, but this one is immobile, so it's attached to this fixed position. There is then a third antibody, which is immobilized at point D, and it is complementary in shape to the first antibody. So what this means is, if you are pregnant, if we think about this in terms of a pregnancy test, you contain the hormone HCG within your urine. That will then bind to the antibody, and any antibodies with the HCG hormone bound to it will then attach to the immobilized antigen at point C. And therefore, you get a colored blue line at this point because we have that blue bead held in that fixed position. You should always have a second blue line, whether you're pregnant or not, at position D though, because this second immobilized antibody is just complementary to the shape of the first one. So it's basically just a control to check that you do definitely have that first antibody in your sample and it is able to move along the test kit. Now, another test we can look at is this one here for the ELISA test, where you would add the test sample from a patient to the base of a beaker, wash to remove any unbound test sample. Then we add an antibody complementary in shape to the antigen you are testing the presence of in the test sample. Again, we then wash to remove any unbound antibody. Add a second antibody that is complementary in shape to the first antibody and binds to the first. The second antibody we can see here has an enzyme attached to it. Um, again, we have to rinse just to make sure if there's any unbound antibody those are taken off. And then the substrate for the enzyme, which is colorless, is added. And this substrate produces a colored product when that enzyme is present. So the presence of color indicates the presence of the antigen in the test sample. And the intensity of the color indicates the quantity present. Now there are some ethical issues surrounding monoclonal antibodies. And that is because within the creation of monoclonal antibodies, you do require animals such as mice to produce the antibodies and tumor cells. And that can lead to ethical debates as to whether the use of animals is justified to enable the better treatment of cancer in humans and to detect diseases, because this will cause discomfort, harm and death to the animals that are being used. Proteins then is our next biological molecule. And they are another example of polymers and the amino acids are the monomers that they're made up from. You do need to know how to draw this general structure of an amino acid. So it is one of the things you could be assessed on in the exam. Now, a way to help you to remember it is to box it into these key groups. You have a central carbon in the middle of the molecule. There's a hydrogen atom that comes off and an R group that comes off the top. Now, those could actually be either way around, top or bottom. The R group represents the variable group. So that changes for all 20 different amino acids. The amine group or amino group that will always be present, and that is NH2. And the carboxyl group that will also always be present, C double bond O, OH. 
Now to make a dipeptide, which means two amino acids bonded together, it would be a condensation reaction, so water would be removed. The bonds that would form would be a peptide bond. To make a polypeptide, that would be when you'd have multiple amino acids joined together and multiple condensation reactions, still all joined together by peptide bonds. So that would create your primary structure of a protein, but that primary structure gets modified into the secondary, that gets modified into the tertiary, or it could be a quaternary. So we're going to go through what all of these four levels of organization or development of a protein look like and how they're held in place. So the first level is the primary structure. And this is what is made straight after translation in protein synthesis. And the definition for this would be a one mark question. It's the order, or you could say the sequence, of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. So that's your polymer. The secondary structure then is when that primary structure is folded or could be modified uh, by twisting so we can see here the alpha helix um, but that would be the key marking point that we then have an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet that's created and those are held in place by hydrogen bonds the secondary structure then gets modified further so it's further folded to create a unique 3d shape and that shape is held in place by ionic, hydrogen, and sometimes disulfide bonds. And it's actually the primary structure that determines the location of these bonds, the ionic, hydrogen, and disulfide bonds. And it's the location of the bonds which determine how it folds and the 3D shape. The final level of organization is the quaternary structure. That's cut off slightly, but that says structure there. Now that is still this unique 3D shape with the same bonds, but the only difference is it's a protein that is made up of more than one polypeptide chain, but it is still the basically the tertiary structure. You just have more than one chain, so we call it quaternary. Enzymes are an example of proteins that you need to know. So an enzyme is a protein in the tertiary structure, so that unique 3D shape. And their function is that they catalyze reactions and they do this by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. Now, every enzyme is specific. And what that means is it can only catalyze one particular reaction. And that is due to the unique shape of the active site, which this is an application of what we just said in the slide before. That primary structure determines the locations of the bonds, that determines the folding and the unique shape. So this is why each enzyme can only catalyze one particular reaction and you get that unique or specific active site. So in that way, the active site is complementary in shape to a particular substrate. Now there's actually different models which explain how enzymes work. And at GCSE, you would have learned the lock and key model, but the accepted model currently is the induced fit model. So that is what you'd be expected to talk about at A level. You wouldn't be expected to mention the lock and key method. So the induced fit model is one that states that the enzyme's active site is induced or it slightly changes shape to mold around the substrate. So initially, the substrate and active site are not completely complementary. But as the substrate binds, that causes the enzyme's active site, to, active site to slightly change shape and mold around. That moving around the substrate puts strain and tension on the bonds and therefore less energy is needed to break the bonds. And that is how enzymes lower the activation energy which is the amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur. There are five factors that you need to know that affect the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. Temperature, pH, substrate concentration, enzyme concentration, and inhibitors. So let's have a look at each one. So for temperature, if there is a lower temperature, that would mean that the molecule, so the enzyme and the substrate would have less kinetic energy. Therefore, they won't have as many successful collisions. 
and you'd have fewer enzyme substrate complexes. That is why the rate is lower at colder temperatures. Above the optimum though, there is now so much kinetic energy that it causes some of the bonds to break. So for example, the hydrogen bonds might break. And that means that the protein loses its unique 3D shape. The active sites change shape and therefore you won't have enzyme substrate complexes forming and the rate decreases. For pH, either side of the optimum pH, which actually can vary depending on where the enzyme is found, either side we have a very rapid denaturing of the enzyme. And that's because either too high or too low a pH will interfere with the charges in the amino acids found at the active sites. That can cause the hydrogen and the ionic bonds to break and again the loss of that tertiary structure and the active site changes shape. So we describe that as the enzyme denaturing and again there'd be fewer enzyme substrate complexes and therefore the rate of reaction decreases. Substrate and enzyme concentration have a similar idea behind them. There's no enzyme denaturing but if we have a look at this one first, if there's insufficient substrate there will be fewer collisions between the substrate and the enzymes and that's why the rate of reaction is lower. But if you add more and more substrate, but no extra enzyme, eventually you'll get to the point where the enzyme active sites are all in use or they're saturated. So even if you add more substrate, there's no more free enzymes, so the reaction can't go any faster. So the rate remains constant. For the enzyme concentration, if there's insufficient enzymes, so at these low concentrations, then the active sites will become saturated with whatever substrate is there. And that's why if we don't add, add more enzyme, the rate will stay low, but as you add more enzyme, the rate will increase. However, you'll get to a point though where if you keep adding more and more enzymes, but don't add any more substrates, you'll just have a surplus of enzymes and there isn't any extra substrate for those enzymes to bind to, so the rate won't increase any further. The last one was the enzyme inhibitors. Now both type of inhibitor, the competitive and the non-competitive, both bind to an enzyme. So in the exam, you have to be specific and say which part of an enzyme they attach to to get the mark. A competitive inhibitor binds to the active site. So we can see that here. And if it can bind to the active site, that means this inhibitor must be the same shape or very similar in shape to the substrate. And if the inhibitor is bound, that will prevent enzyme substrate complexes forming. So if you add more substrate, for a competitive inhibitor, the substrate will actually eventually be able to knock out the inhibitor, take its place, and therefore with a very, very high concentration of substrate, the effect of the inhibitor is no longer seen. However, a non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, and that is a part of the enzyme away from the active site. So it doesn't bind to the active site. But as it binds, it causes the active site to change shape. And for that reason, the inhibitor has made it impossible for enzyme substrate complexes to occur because the substrate is no longer complementary to that active site and it can't bind. So that is how these inhibitors lower the rate of reaction. And even if you add more substrate, that won't help because the active site is a different shape. The test for proteins is you add biuret, which is blue in color, and if you have a protein present, it will go purple. Digestion and absorption. And during digestion, large biological molecules are hydrolyzed into smaller soluble molecules, which can be absorbed across the cell membranes. Now, there's three biological molecules that you need to know the digestion of, and that's carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So with the carbohydrates, there's actually more than one enzyme that's needed to hydrolyze them from the polysaccharides to the monosaccharides. We have amylases and membrane-bound disaccharidases. So digestion begins in the mouth, it will then continue in the duodenum, and then it's completed in the ileum. And the first thing is the amylase that is produced 
by the salivary glands is going to be doing the digestion in the mouth. But you also have amylase producing the pancreas and that is going to be releasing the amylase into the duodenum. And this hydrolyzes the polysaccharides into the disaccharide maltose and that is by breaking the glycosidic bonds between the molecules in the polysaccharide. Then we have sucrase and it could be lactase as well, which are membrane bound enzymes that hydrolyze sucrose and lactose into monosaccharides. You could also have maltase, which would be hydrolyzing maltose into glucose. For proteins, these are large biological molecules, they're polymers, and they are hydrolyzed by three enzymes. We have the endopeptidases, which hydrolyze the peptide bonds between amino acids in the middle of a polymer chain. We have the exopeptidases, which are going to do hydrolysis and break the peptide bonds between amino acids at the end of the chains. And then the membrane-bound dipeptidases will be breaking the peptide bonds between two amino acids. So it hydrolyzes those dipeptides. Now where this is actually happening is firstly in the stomach. So that's where it begins. It continues in the duodenum and then it's fully digested within the ileum. Lipids are digested by lipase or lipase and also through the action of bile salts. Now lipase is produced in the pancreas and it can hydrolyze the ester bonds in triglycerides to form monoglycerides and fatty acids. What the bile salts do after they've been produced by the liver is emulsify lipids to form tiny droplets called micelles. And these increase the surface area available for the lipase to bind onto and therefore act on. So they're going to be making this digestion more efficient. So we can see here the physical and the chemical digestion. Physical is the emulsification and that micelle formation. Chemical digestion is the action of the lipase. So the physical, this is where the lipids are coated in bile salts to create an emulsion. Many of those small droplets of lipids provide a larger surface area to make hydrolysis faster. And as we said, the chemical is just the action of lipase. Now, a micelle is a vesicle formed of fatty acids, glycerol, monoglycerides and bile salts. But we're going to have a look at how that aids in the absorption of lipids. So lipids are digested into monoglycerides and fatty acids by the action of lipase and the bile salts. And that is how we create these tiny structures, which are the micelles. When the micelles encounter the ileum epithelial cells, Due to that non-polar nature of the fatty acids and monoglycerides, they can simply diffuse across the cell surface membrane to enter the cells of the epithelium. Once in the cell, these will then be modified back into triglycerides inside of the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi body. And then they can form vesicles and be um, released from the cell into the lacteal and be transported around the body. So absorption in mammals is taking place in the ileum. And this is where it links to the villi and the microvilli and the adaptations that these structures have. So the ileum wall is covered in villi and they have thin walls surrounded by a network of capillaries. And they also are covered in epithelial cells that have even smaller microvilli on them. And that is creating that large surface area. The fact that the walls are so thin is providing a short diffusion distance and that network of capillaries is maintaining the concentration gradients. Now this actually links to as well topic two when you learnt about co-transport. And that is because the monosaccharides like glucose and amino acids can only be absorbed by active transport in the form of co-transport. And that is because there's usually a higher concentration of either amino acids or glucose already in the epithelial cell. So in order to be able to move even more from the ileum into the epithelial cell, we require this co-transport. But that theory is covered in topic two. Now, haemoglobin is involved in the mass transport of oxygen around the body.
And it's an example of a quaternary structured protein because it's made up of four polypeptide chains. You also have a range of different types of hemoglobins. One that we'll be looking at is myoglobin, which is found in the muscle tissue in vertebrates and also in fetuses. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a way to look at how hemoglobin behaves in different conditions. Oxygen is loaded in regions with a high partial pressure of oxygen. So what that means is when hemoglobin is in areas with a lot of oxygen available, such as the alveoli, it will be able to pick up lots of oxygen. In regions with a low partial pressure of oxygen, for example, respiring tissues, hemoglobin unloads the oxygen. And that is how we get the shape of this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. We can see at the different partial pressures how saturated hemoglobin is with oxygen. And the more saturated it is, that means it must have loaded up with more oxygen. The less saturated it is, it must have unloaded oxygen and that's why it's not holding very much anymore. So we can see here we've got our respiring tissues compared to the alveoli. Now this graph also demonstrates cooperative binding. And this cooperative nature of oxygen binding to haemoglobin is due to the haemoglobin change in shape when the first oxygen binds. It then makes it easier for the subsequent oxygens to bind. Now you can also see dissociation curves to demonstrate the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect is when a high carbon dioxide concentration or partial pressure causes the oxyhemoglobin curve to shift to the right. The affinity for oxygen decreases, and that is because the acidic carbon dioxide changes the shape of the haemoglobin slightly, and therefore it means the haemoglobin behaves differently, and it's more likely to unload the haemoglobin even at the same partial pressures. So we can see here we've got three curves at different pHs, and the lower the pH, the more carbon dioxide there would be present. So we can see here at pH 7.6 compared to let's say 7.2, the curve has shifted to the right and even at the same partial pressure, so we'll pick 20, we can see that the saturation is only about 25% but for this one it's just under 60% and that is because of this Bohr effect. So low partial pressure of carbon dioxide would typically be in the alveoli because you are exhaling that carbon dioxide. A high partial pressure of carbon dioxide would be at respiring tissues because carbon dioxide is produced in respiration. Now that would be an advantage because it means that haemoglobin will behave differently, it will unload oxygen more readily and therefore it's unloading the oxygen at the respiring tissues. Now different animals have haemoglobin adapted to their particular needs and environments also. And that is one thing that you could get application questions on. So a fetus, and this is a human fetus, they will have myoglobin or fetal haemoglobin. And the fetal haemoglobin has an even higher affinity for oxygen, even at the same partial pressures compared to adult haemoglobin. And that's an advantage because it means that as the blood is circulating through the umbilical cord, the fetus's haemoglobin is able to load the oxygen off of the mother's adult haemoglobin. Llamas are found at high altitudes where we have very, very low partial pressures of oxygen. So for the llama, we can see that they also have haemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen, even at lower partial pressures. So we can see that would mean that if there isn't very much oxygen available, which there wouldn't be at a high altitude, then the haemoglobin is still able to load up. Animals like doves, for example, their needs are that they need more oxygen to match their faster metabolism because they're flying so much and need oxygen for the muscle contraction. So the haemoglobin of a dove, the curve actually is shifted to the right compared to human haemoglobin. And that means that the haemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen and therefore it will more readily unload the oxygen which is needed for respiration.
Earthworms, a different example, so they will be underground a lot where there's very low partial pressures of oxygen. So they have haemoglobin that has very high affinities, even at low partial pressures, so that their haemoglobin can load up with whatever oxygen is available. In mammals, the circulatory system is described as closed and double. Closed meaning that the blood remains within the blood vessels the entire time, and double referring to the fact that the blood passes through the heart twice in each circuit. So there is one circuit that delivers blood from the heart to the lungs, and the other circuit delivers the blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Mammals require to have a double circulatory system to manage the pressure of blood flow. The blood flows through the lungs at a lower pressure, and this is to prevent damage to the capillaries in the alveoli, but it also means that the blood will flow at a slower speed, so there is more time for gas exchange. The oxygenated blood from the lungs then goes back to the heart and it's pumped out at a higher pressure to the rest of the body. And this is important to make sure that the blood is able to reach all of those respiring cells in the body. Now the key blood vessels that you need to know about are, first of all, the coronary arteries, and these are the arteries that cover the heart itself to supply the heart muscle or cardiac muscle with oxygenated blood. You also need to know the four blood vessels that are delivering blood into and out of the heart, the vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. You need to know the blood vessels that deliver blood to the lungs and carry it away, so the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. So any time that you see pulmonary, that is referring to the lungs. And you can see here that the pulmonary artery is carrying blood away from the heart to the lungs. The lungs will then oxygenate the blood and the pulmonary vein is delivering that blood back into the heart. The kidneys, we have the renal artery and the renal vein. So where you see the word renal, that is referring to a blood vessel attached to the kidneys. Those major blood vessels are connected within this double circulatory system via arteries, arterioles, capillaries and veins. The cardiac muscle has a range of special features. Now the walls of the heart have a very, very thick muscular layer so that it can contract with high force to deliver high pressure blood to all of the body cells. Now the unique properties that the cardiac muscle has is first of all, it's myogenic and that means it can contract and relax without nervous or hormonal stimulation. It also never fatigues. So as long as it has a constant supply of oxygen and glucose, it will be able to respire aerobically. The coronary arteries we can see here, they are what supply the cardiac muscle with this oxygen and glucose so that it never fatigues. They branch off from the aorta, which we can see here. And if one of those coronary arteries was to become blocked, that would then mean that the heart muscle or the cardiac muscle wouldn't be receiving the oxygen or glucose, therefore the cardiac muscle wouldn't be able to respire and it would stop contracting. And that would cause a myocardial infarction or in other words, a heart attack. So you need to know some of the key structures of the heart. First of all, there are four chambers. We have two atria at the top and we have the two ventricles at the bottom. The atria have thinner muscular walls and that's because they don't need to contract with as much force because they're only delivering the blood from the atria into the ventricles. They also have elastic walls so that they can stretch when the blood is entering. The ventricles have much thicker muscular walls and that is so they can contract with more force and pump the blood out at higher pressure because they are carrying the blood for distances, either to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Now the right ventricle is pumping the blood to the lungs and that is at a lower pressure, as we said, to prevent damage to the capillaries and go at a slower speed. So comparatively, the right ventricle wall has a thinner muscular layer. The left ventricle has a much thicker muscular layer in its wall because it has to contract with more force to pump the blood at high pressure around the body. Highlighted here, we have the four key blood vessels. We've got the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, the vena cava and the pulmonary veins. 
But for some of them, there's actually multiple. So we can see we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. We also have the pulmonary artery, which is carrying the blood away from the heart to the lungs. But we have one coming out of the left and one out of the right. Same with the pulmonary veins, which is carrying blood into the left atrium from the lungs. We have one on the left side, one on the right side. And the reason for both of those is we have a right lung and a left lung. The aorta is carrying blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now, some of the ways just to try and remember what each of these are doing are, first of all, if you see veins, veins are carrying blood into the heart. And vena cava means vein and cava means body. So that is carrying the deoxygenated blood from the body into the right atrium. Pulmonary, we said, means lungs and again, it's a vein. So it's carrying oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. Arteries, think A away, it's carrying blood away from the heart. So pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. And the aorta is the major artery, which is carrying oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now the valves that you need to know about are the semilunar valves, which are in the aorta and the pulmonary artery as well as the atrioventricular valves, which are between the atria and the ventricles. Sometimes you'll see those called the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. And we can see these labelled here on the diagram of the heart. Now, valves are to prevent the backflow of blood. And they do this by only opening when the pressure is higher behind the valve compared to in front. So if the pressure is higher in front, it causes the valve to shut and that is how it stops the blood from flowing backwards. The septum is running through the middle of the heart to separate the blood on the deoxygenated and the oxygenated side and that's to help to maintain a high concentration of oxygen in the oxygenated blood to make sure that these diffusion gradients are maintained so that diffusion can occur at respiring cells. Looking at the blood vessels that are connecting all of the major blood vessels together, we have the arteries, arterioles, capillaries and veins. Arteries, as we said, think A away, they carry blood away from the heart towards the arterioles. The arterioles are smaller than arteries and connect to the capillaries. The capillaries connect the arterioles to the veins and the veins will then carry blood back into the heart. So we can see here our arteries connected to our arterioles. We then have this capillary bed or network of capillaries connecting to the venules and then the vein. So if the structures of the arteries and vein are quite different because of the fact that one is carrying blood away from the heart and one's carrying it into, so the pressure of the blood they're carrying will vary. So arteries have a much thicker muscular layer compared to the veins. And that is so that constriction and dilation can occur to control the volume of blood flowing through them. They also have a thicker elastic layer than the veins, and that's to help maintain the blood pressure. So the walls can actually stretch and recoil in response to the heartbeat. So overall, the thickness of the wall is thicker because of those two thick layers, but also it stops the blood vessels from bursting at that high pressure. So we can see here how thick those walls are. They also don't have any valves. So in comparison, veins have a much thinner muscular layer, thinner elastic layer and thinner walls in general. And that is because the blood is at lower pressure, so they're not at risk of bursting. However, because the blood is at lower pressure, they do require valves to help prevent the backflow of the blood um, to make sure that the blood is going to be pumped back into the heart. The capillaries are very, very narrow in diameter. And this is to make sure that the blood speed is going to slow right down as it's passing through the capillaries. And that is to allow time for gas exchange and tissue fluid formation in the capillaries. So we've already talked about the arteries and the veins. But if we now add in the arterioles and capillaries, the arterioles are thicker than in the arteries, the muscular layer. And that is to help restrict the blood flow to the capillaries. The elastic layer is thinner than the arteries, and that is because the pressure is now slightly lower. 
and overall the wall is thinner compared to the arteries because the pressure is slightly lower but they still don't have valves. Capillaries do not have any muscular or elastic tissue layer. They are only one cell thick and that is to make sure there's a really short diffusion distance because the function of the capillaries is that is where exchange of materials between the blood and the cells occur. The cardiac cycle is split into three stages. Now people pronounce this differently so I'm going to say both diastole or distally, atrial systole or atrial systole and ventricular systole or systole. And we're going to go through what happens at each stage. So in diastole, the atria and ventricle muscles are relaxed. And this is when blood will enter the atria through the vena cava and the pulmonary vein. And the blood flowing into the atria then causes an increase in the pressure because we've now got a larger volume of liquid there. Then we get atrial systole occurring. And that is when the atria muscles contract and that increases the pressure even more in the atria. And because we now have this high pressure, that causes the atrioventricular valves to open and blood moves from the atria into the ventricles. And at this stage, the ventricle muscles are relaxed. We have ventricular diastole. The last stage then we have is ventricular systole which is when the ventricle muscles contract and that happens after a short delay and it will increase the pressure beyond that of the atria which causes these atrioventricular valves to shut but when they've contracted high enough to increase the pressure above that of the atria and pulmonary artery the semilunar valves will open and that causes blood to be pumped out of those two blood vessels. You could be asked to calculate the cardiac output, and that is the volume of blood which leaves one ventricle in one minute. And it can be calculated by doing the heart rate times the stroke volume. And the heart rate is beats of the heart in one minute. Stroke volume is the volume of blood that leaves the heart each beat, and that is in decimeters cubed. Tissue fluid is a fluid that contains water, glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions and oxygen and it's the liquid that is forced out of the capillaries to bathe the cells to make sure the cells are getting all of the uh, minerals, nutrients that they require from the blood. Now it's formed due to the fact that capillaries have very, very small gaps between each of the cells that make up the capillary walls. And as the blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, the smaller diameter results in a very, very high hydrostatic pressure of the blood. And because we have this high hydrostatic pressure and tiny gaps between the cells that make up the capillary walls, water and small molecules are forced out. So glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions, oxygen are all forced out of the capillary to the surrounding cells. And that is called ultra filtration. So the molecules that can be forced out, we just went through all of those, but anything that is too big cannot get out of those tiny gaps between the capillary cells. And that would be things like the red blood cells, platelets, and large proteins. So those will remain in the blood. And the fact that they remain in the blood is actually what enables the liquid from the tissue fluid to be reabsorbed again. So towards the venule end of the capillary, which is over here, the hydrostatic pressure has decreased. And that's because so much liquid has been forced out, the pressure within the capillary has now dropped by the time we've got to the venule end of the capillary. However, we don't have as much liquid, but we have lots of those large proteins that have remained behind, which has lowered the water potential of the blood in the capillary compared to the water potential in the liquid surrounding the cells, which is the tissue fluid. And as a result, that liquid is going to, or the water is going to re-enter by osmosis and it will carry with it waste that is dissolved in that tissue fluid that was released from the cells. So things like carbon dioxide and urea. So that gets absorbed into the capillaries by osmosis 
and then it'll be transported around the body to be removed as waste. Now, not all of the liquid will be reabsorbed by osmosis because eventually equilibrium will be reached and the water potential inside of the capillary and of the tissue fluid will be the same. So any of that water that doesn't get reabsorbed by osmosis will enter the lymphatic system instead. And then when we have it transported around the um, lymphatic system, it will eventually get to one of the lymph vessels near the heart where that liquid is drained into the blood again. And that is how we don't run out of liquid in the blood. So the last bit of topic three is mass transport in plants. And we start with the mass transport of water looking at, first of all, transpiration. So transpiration is the loss of water vapour from the stomata. So water evaporates out of stomata on the leaves. And there are four key factors that affect the rate of transpiration. First of all, light intensity. The more light there is present, the more stomata will open, and therefore there's a larger surface area for evaporation. If it's hotter, that means that the water molecules will have more kinetic energy, and therefore they'll be moving faster and evaporate at a faster rate. With humidity, the more water vapour that is in the air, that will actually make the water potential more positive outside of the leaf, and it reduces the water potential gradient. So what that means is the more humid it is, the less transpiration there will be occurring. With wind, because the wind is carrying away air that contains water vapour, the wind will actually be maintaining the water potential gradient. So the more windy it is, the faster the rate of transpiration. So how water actually moves from the roots all the way up the xylem to transpire out of the stomata links to this idea of the cohesion tension theory. So water has to move up the plant from the roots against gravity, and that can be a very, very large distance if it's a huge tree. And this is possible because of the cohesion, the capillarity or adhesion and root pressure. So if we look at cohesion first, this links to the theory of water. Water is dipolar, meaning we've got two slight charges, two different charges, a slight negative on the oxygen and a slight positive on the hydrogen atoms. And that means hydrogen bonds can form between the hydrogen and oxygen of different water molecules. And it creates this cohesion or sticking together of the water molecules. Now that's an advantage because as the water moves up the xylem, that means it's all bonded together with these hydrogen bonds and it moves up as a continuous column of water and it's much easier to pull up a column than it is individual water molecules. The next idea was this idea of adhesion, whereby the water molecules will actually also stick to the walls of the xylem. And if you have a really narrow xylem, that will increase this capillarity effect, and therefore the liquid will be moving up more just from this sticking, this adhesion effect. So the narrower the xylem, the easier it's going to be to transport the liquid up the xylem against gravity. Root pressure is the final concept, and this is as the water moves into the roots by osmosis, it increases the volume of liquid inside the roots, and therefore the pressure inside the root increases as well. And we call that root pressure. And that creates this positive pressure, which means it's a pushing force. Because we have lots of water in the roots, it pushes all of the water above it upwards. So it helps push the water up the xylem. So those three concepts all work together for the cohesion tension theory. And that's how water moves up against gravity. So just have a look at this at a whole. The first thing that happens is the water evaporates out of the stomata. And as that water vapour is leaving, that is then leaving behind this lower pressure because liquid has been lost. And that creates this negative pressure, or in other words, a pulling force. And that pulls the water column up the xylem. And because of cohesion, we have that water column whereby all the water molecules are stuck together.
The water molecules are also adhering or sticking to the walls of the xylem to help pull the column upwards. And as the column of water is pulling up, it also creates tension in the xylem, which actually pulls the xylem inwards, making it narrower, which increases that impact of the capillarity or the adhesion, and it helps to move the water up even more. Now, the second type of mass transport in plants is looking at how the organic molecules like glucose produced in photosynthesis are transported around. And this now happens in the phloem. Now, the phloem tissue contains two key cells. We have the sieve tube elements and the companion cells. And the sieve tube elements, which are here, are living cells, but they don't contain any nuclei, and they're very few organelles. And that is so it's pretty much hollow to make it easy for the solutions to transport through the tube. The companion cells are on the outside, and they provide the ATP required for active transport of the organic substances. So they have all the organelles that the sieve tube elements don't, so they can provide the resources needed. Now, the transport of these organic molecules within solution is often explained using this source to sink model. So we have here the xylem next to the phloem. And the source in this model would be a photosynthesizing cell. The sink, which is where the sugars are going to be delivered, is a respiring cell. So at the source, we have photosynthesizing cells. And the sucrose or glucose that would be made in photosynthesis is going to lower the water potential of those cells. And therefore, any surrounding water in the plant or from the xylem is going to be entering those cells by osmosis. At the other end, where we have our respiring sink cells, because they'll be using up those sugars in respiration, there will be a more positive water potential inside of the cell compared to outside. And therefore, water is going to leave the respiring cells by osmosis to other cells in the plant or even the xylem. So the effect that has is there'll be an increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the source cell, but a decrease in the sink cell. And because of those pressure changes, the liquids that are within that source cell will be forced by that high hydrostatic pressure through the xylem all the way to the sink cell. Now, that is part of the story, but also you need to know the translocation steps. So how those sugars within the leaf cell actually make it into the phloem for that pressure then to actually move the liquid along. So photosynthesis is occurring in the chloroplast, in the leaves, and we're calling those the source cells. That, we said, creates a high concentration of sucrose. Now, as well as that affecting the water potential, that also means that the sucrose can diffuse down its concentration gradient into the companion cell by facilitated diffusion. We then get active transport of protons or hydrogen ions from the companion cell into the space within the cell walls and that uses energy because it's active transport. Now that creates a concentration gradient and therefore the protons move down their gradient via carrier proteins into the sieve tube elements. And the co-transport of sucrose with those hydrogen ions occurs via a protein co-transporter and that is how the sucrose goes from being in the companion cell into the phloem, even though there is a high concentration often of sugar or sucrose in the phloem already. So the next step then is we're looking at the movement of that sucrose within the phloem, sieve tube element. So the increase of sucrose in the sieve tube element is going to lower that water potential. And therefore, water enters those sieve tube elements from the xylem vessels, which are tightly compacted next to the phloem. The increase in water volume in the sieve tube element at this position will increase the hydrostatic pressure. And this is where we have the idea of source to sink. It causes the liquid to be forced from the source area down to the sink cells. Lastly, the sucrose is then used in respiration at the sink, or it might be stored away as starch if it's not currently required. 
But that means more sucrose is actively transported into the sink cells and that is going to cause the water potential to decrease. And as a result, um, we'll have water moving by osmosis from the sieve tube elements into the sink cell. Some water will also be returning from the sieve tube element into the xylem. The removal of that water is decreasing the volume in the sieve tube element and therefore the hydrostatic pressure decreases. So the movement of soluble organic substances is due to the difference in the hydrostatic pressure between the source and the sink end of the sieve tube element. Now you could be asked about two particular investigations that prove translocation. The first one is called traces. And this is where we have tracing involving radioactively labelling carbon. Plants are provided with only radioactively labelled carbon dioxide. And over time, they'll be absorbing that in through the stomata, using it in photosynthesis. And the organic substances like the sugars created will all contain that radioactively labelled carbon. Thin slices from the stems are then cut and placed on X-ray film that will turn black when exposed to radioactive material. When the stems are placed on the X-ray film, the section of the stem containing the sugars turn black, and this highlights where the phloem are, and it can show the sugars are transported in the phloem, and it also means you can track the route that is taken. Ringing experiments is when a ring of bark and phloem are peeled and removed off the trunk, like we can see here. The result of removing the phloem is that the trunk swells above the removed section and analysis of the liquid in this swelling shows it contains sugar. So this shows that when the phloem is removed, the sugars cannot be transported and it therefore proves the phloem transports sugars. So that is it for topic three. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. And if you want to learn any of those in more detail, then click these links to see the full playlist.